Good morning. Welcome to this uh, sixth uh, MHEAD Hub Talk. Uh, this is very uh, strategic, part of the MHEAD Hub team. Um, it's a pleasure for us to have you here. Uh, as you might notice, this session is being recorded uh, because we are building a playlist in, with all the Hub Talks. Uh, and now I'm, I will give the floor to, to Madalena and uh, also Violeta will start. So thank you very much. Thank you, Belen. So very welcome to this sixth webinar of our series of Hub Tours 2021, organized by the European MPL Hub, EU, ITU and WHO, patient-centric approaches in mHealth. Uh, the setup of lecture scale and health programs is hindered by organ organizational, technical, economic and cultural barriers that require tailored adaptations to be set up progressively and integrated in current care services. The strategic objective two of the World Health Organization uh, Global Strategy on Digital Health 2021-25 uh, encourages the development of a national strategy on digital health through an all-inclusive multi-stakeholder approach, including actors collaborating within communities of practice and with consideration to the following core of components, leadership and governance, investment and operations, services and applications for scaling up, integration and sustainability, while standards and interoperability are respected, uh, flexible digital infrastructure, and adaptable health workforce and legislation, ethics policies and compliance, and a people-centered approach. Precisely on this very important last point, and the point of this poll, Focus is the strategic objective four of the WHO Global Strategy on Digital Health 2025. Advocate people-centered health systems that are enabled by digital health, which make emphasis on placing people at the center of digital health through the adoption and use of digital health technologies in a scaling up and a strengthening health service delivery. The individual is an essential component in the delivery of trust-based people-centered care. This focus covers not only patients, families and communities, but also the health workers who need to be prepared to deploy or use digital health technologies in their work. Planning for capacity building includes workforce assessment, ranging from professionals in information and communication technologies to health workers providing care services. Being intrinsically multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, capacity building entails installing capacities, attitudes and skills, which may range from computer sciences, strategic planning, finance and management to health sciences and care delivery, depending on the digital health application and its context. Assessment of the workforce should also consider the implications for the health labor market of introducing digital technologies and their management. I take the opportunity to call for countries to move away from the current disease focus systems to an integrated approach with the patient at the center. Attitudes to practices in public awareness of digital health should also be addressed. Possible actions include improving digital health literacy at the population level, engagement of patients, families and communities, and education of patients about health. Better responding to the social and commercial determinants of health to improve digital health and able health systems will need the engagement of civil society, but also non-health sectors and actors. Increasing awareness of evidence-based self-management tools and increasing access to these is a further action to consider. So, with no more delay, I give the floor to our excellent speakers of this webinar, which will show the real outcomes of adaptations of mHealth solutions to different contexts, providing an opportunity to learn by exchanging experiences on successful approaches and bottlenecks overcame by different countries and regions. Thank you very much.
Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to see you all here today. Um, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for the set, scene setting, Violetta. Excellent. So I'll quickly introduce myself. This is the first time I've joined the MHEL Hub series today. I'm delighted to be here. I'm Michelle Brogan. I'm a, a digital innovation lead and I work for um, an innovation centre in Scotland called the Digital Health and Care Innovation Centre. I'm also a strategic lead for diabetes within the Scottish Government and I'm delighted to be here to support this uh, and moderate this session today. We've got uh, some fantastic speakers lined up and I think we'll just get cracking and we'll look forward to having some really useful and productive discussion um, at the end of the four presentations which you'll now have. So if I can introduce please Ozan um, and Emut from the Turkish Ministry of Health and they will set the scene and kick us off with the first presentation today. Ozan. Thank you Michelle, hi. Uh, let me share my screen real quick. And then... Okay, I think and hope you are able to see my screen. Yes, we are. Okay, wonderful. Well, good morning uh, once again to all participants. Thank you very much for your interest in the webinar today. Uh, it means a lot to me to see your interest in our project uh, with this webinar today. I hope you will find the presentation and the sessions interesting too. Um, this is Ozan Behan from Ministry of Health of Turkey. I'm a consultant at General Directorate of Health Information Systems. Today, I'm going to be presenting you Pro Empower, a project that we carried out in Horizon 2020 program for um, self-management of diabetes through mHealth technologies. And of course, I will go, I'm going to be reflecting the uh, lessons learned uh, from this project. Uh, our project Pro Empower, pre-commercial procurement of innovative ICT for patient empowerment and self-management for patients with type 2 diabetes started in the fall of 2016, uh, in October 2016 to be exact, and after a 48-month calendar, it ended successfully. It's a PCP project, a pre-commercial procurement project funded by the European Commission's Horizon 2020 program. It has a budget of 4 million two hundred and and 80,000 euros, 3 million of which is the procurement budget of the project. In Pro Empower, we were 11 partners from six countries, and four of these partners were the procurers of the project, namely Ministry of Health of Turkey, Shared Services of Ministry of Health of Portugal, uh, Murcia Health Services from Spain, and Campania region of Italy. Our project was also supported by an adjacent advisory board. Um, what's in the focus of Pro Empower is the chronic disease of diabetes, as our motivation was the fact that the procurer's care systems are facing an increasing prevalence of diabetes. The disease is expected to grow globally from 8.8% in uh, 2015 to 10.4% in 2040, if not effective countermeasures are put in place. Furthermore, diabetes is seen more and more in younger years, but also it's increasing among older population with the age group 80 and higher seeing a strong onset of diabetes. And uh, we therefore came up with this project Pro Empower in order to initiate an investment up to 3 million euros in R&D procurement of a personalized diabetes management solution to support patients with type 2 diabetes. Once again, we are four countries, mainly from the Mediterranean region, where the prevalence and incidence of diabetes is quite high. We had several unmet needs in Pro Empower from the fact that healthcare systems in the world are reactive and fragmented, to the fact that patients are lacking ownership, and also current treatment of diabetes patients are proving to be rather ineffective. And there are several other key challenge areas where we thought there were room for improvement, such as all the green tiles you see in the picture. 
the PCP solutions we deployed in Prem Power tried to address several important building blocks of diabetes management, such as interoperability of the systems and integration of devices, healthier lifestyle, glucose control and decision support tools, patient to professional coordination, quality reporting, which are all components of a personalized diabetes management system. Um, the Prempower was an innovation procurement project, and the tool we used is PCP, uh, pre-commercial procurement. In PCP projects, uh, the procurers, in our case, healthcare providers, invest in R&D activities for products and services which are not yet available in the market and which address uh, their unmet needs. Then, once procured for R&D, selected supplier develop solutions called for through an open call and followed by competitive phases of R&D, which are our solution design, prototype development, and pilot testing, which all occur in consecutive phases you see on the screen. Phase one is solution design, phase two is prototype development, and phase three is the pilot phase when the developed systems are tested in real life conditions. We launched the call for tenders in Pro Empower in early 2018, and when it was time to open the tenders after the submission deadline, we saw that we received a total of 15 offers, four of which were submitted by single entities and 11 of which were submitted by consortia of suppliers. In other words, they were joint tenders. The solutions we tested in pilot trials of phase Three of the project under real life conditions are dm for all and DiaWatch, which are respectively developed by a consortium led by Gnomon from Greece and a consortium led, led by Take for Care from Italy. Both consortia have good um, geographical coverage of the procurers as well as their capacity in terms of addressing the requirements um, set out in the challenge brief of the project. Uh, what we did in the pilot phase of the project was mainly a technology trial as opposed to a medical trial. The pilots went on for different amounts of time between July 2019 and July 2020. We had four pilot sites in the project from the locations of the procurer uh, partners and uh, at least an eight month pilot, tri pilot trial was achieved with 400 patients and 82 healthcare professionals. Um, although Pro Empower 2 combined uh, a technology trial rather than a medical exper experiment, there were some clinical parameters as well that we used in order to evaluate the efficiency of the systems. Maybe the most important one is the, uh, the hemoglobin level, which is uh, hemoglobin A1C. This is an important indicator in the management of diabetic population. Um, research re researchers suggest that even 1% reduction in hemoglobin levels means that the risk of diabetes related death decreases by 21%. The risk of myocardial infarctions, infarctions decreased by uh, 14%. The risk of microvascular complications decreases by 37%, and the risk of amputations or general death rate decreases by 43%. And in Prem Power, we saw that there was a range of 012 to 0.95% reduction in the patient's hemoglobin A1C levels even after the short time of an eight month period, uh, pilot trial period. I have more detailed information about these medical indicators, which I will just not present now because of the time limit, but I will be happy to uh, share them with you with an email if you're interested, just send me an email. We also try to measure user satisfaction at the end of the pilot trials. Um, your patient feedback suggested a relatively high satisfaction with both of the solutions. 
Um, no, since today's theme is not only about experiences, but also about lessons learned and to share them with the participants here today, I have come up with some remarks on these lessons learned, and I would like to share them with you, if I may. When you are preparing a project proposal for innovation, for innovation procurement projects, or you don't have to submit a project, but when you are planning to procure something innovative, uh, I would recommend to know the procurement tool you will be using well. Are you going to do PCP, PPI, any national or international procurement tool? The more you know about the procurement method, the more um, smoothly things are likely to go. We should be and now we should be defining the challenge clear enough for the suppliers to develop and customize tailored solutions for our needs. Also related to that is uh, our need uh, is our need really urgent and unmet because if something is already available in the market, you might as well go ahead and procure it instantly without taking the risks of R and D. What are the targeted impacts and how do you plan to maximize impact? Um, we are all using ICT in our daily routine and in our clinics but are there any KPIs to measure impact? For instance, do we intend to scale up the approach in order to, maxim in order to take maximum benefit from it? And um, no matter what we are doing, no matter what we are doing new or procuring something new, do we have a change management plan? Are the people who are going to use this ready for the change? Are they willing to accept the innovation and integrate it in their um, daily routine. I think all public buyers are uh, procuring ICT systems from the suppliers in the private sector. The suppliers are there and ready uh, to serve to our needs, but it is our, the public buyer's responsibility to reach out to as many vendors as possible and also the best vendors uh, if possible. The suppliers will be asking us questions not only about the system to be procured, but also about the procurement tool itself. We should be ready to provide adequate information to them. In the ever competing arena of suppliers, sometimes SMEs offer uh, the most innovative solutions. So we should be encouraging them to, uh, to partake in the innovation procurement activities more frequently. Some vendors may be unable to cover the whole procurement challenge, in which case it may be a good idea to offer them matchmaking tools. And finally, uh, we public procurers are the demanding customers of technology that promote the development, uh, development and testing of uh, new solutions. Therefore, last but not least, it's our responsibility to do R&D for society with the society itself, so we should be including end users in every stage of the trials. I believe that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take your questions if you have any now or at the end of the discussions, however our moderator sees it fit. Thank you, Ozan. That was a fantastic presentation. Very successful project and resonating a lot of your lessons learned, I'm sure resonating with several of us involved in this. Um, looking at the schedule, we do, uh, don't do have a huge amount of time, but um, just to remind people that if you want to ask a question, if you can pop it in the chat, then we will have um, be able to pick this up at the end of the four presentations. So, um, if people are comfortable, I think we will move on to the second presentation at this point. So um, I'd like now to introduce um, Lorenzo and Massimilio, um, who will be describing their experiences of implementing a large scale um, health solution for diabetes in Italy. Thank, thank you. you. Th thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll start first. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, for the uh, for the invitation, let me share my screen. Can you see the slides? Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. As I, as I was saying, thank you for the invitation. My name is Lorenzo Joss. I'm a project manager 
in Trentino Salute 4.0, which is a competent center of digital health of the province of Trento in the northern part of Italy. And I'll try to present in 10 minutes, so I will leave 10 minutes also to Massimiliano. Uh, I will try to present, to give you an overview of the public driven approach that we are following in the province of Trento to promote um, mobile health, patient centric, uh, approach for diabetes. Just a, the first slide to setting the scene. Uh, as we know, as a public health sector, we are experiencing what is called a perfect storm in the sense that we are experiencing a mix of at least three critical issues like the increase in healthcare costs. Uh, at the same time, we are witnessing a growing a chronic disease burden, particularly for diabetes. And unfortunately, we are also experiencing a shortage of healthcare professionals and somehow the COVID pandemic uh, has even more highlighted these critical issues. But at the same time, we have new opportunities provided by the telemedicine and new technologies. But at the same time, we know that new technology is not enough. We might have a number of new tools, a number of new technologies, but if we are not able to integrate this technology into new organizational assets, the technology would not be an option uh, anyway. So it is important that we are able to combine and to harmonize new technologies into new organizational models and assets in public health. And in order to do that, in the province of Trento, we launched uh, in 2016 a competence center for digital health, which is uh, called Trentino Salute 4.0, which is a strategic alliance among three public stakeholders in the field of public health. The autonomous province of Trento, in its role of decision and policy maker, the local health care trust as a health service provider and an institution which is uh, particularly known in the area of new technologies and artificial intelligence, which is the Bruno Kessler Foundation. So this alliance was made up to lead a public driven approach in, uh, in, in uh, digital health in our province. And through this uh, collaboration, we were able to co-design involving patients, healthcare staff, policymakers, we were able to co-design a tool for monitoring patients with diabetes. And this tool is called Track Diabetes. Actually, rather than being a simple a standalone tool, it's uh, actually a, um, a platform that can enable both patients and healthcare staff uh, in managing uh, diabetes. In terms of tools, we developed an app for patients and this app was co-designed with patients with diabetes and medical doctors to fit exactly the needs of the patients. And there are different features like incorporating uh, lifestyles recommendations or enabling patients to uh, record or to upload health related information, but also this app is a platform for telemedicine. So charts, televisits and telemonitoring. So it's a way to keep uh, together and to improve communication, even in a remote way uh, among patients and healthcare staff. We also managed to include a virtual coach system that is a virtual assistant supported by artificial intelligence, yeah, artificial intelligence that can support and guide the patient in terms of promoting healthy lifestyles and behavior changes. From the um, healthcare staff perspective, uh, this platform has a medical dashboard the medical doctor and nurses can use to monitor remotely the patients and also they are receiving through this platform uh, a reporting a recurrent and automated reports that are designed to keep the medical 
staff informed about the trajectory of the patient uh, disease. This, as I said, is the is the actual uh, tool that that we are using, but we wanted to include in this tool two specific approaches uh, in line with a patient centric uh, approach. The first one is the step at care approach. I'm, I'm sure you are all familiar with this. We know that each patient is unique. We know that each patient is experiencing different levels of complexity and this means different levels of resources that the healthcare system has, has to provide the patient with. So to respect the step at care approach, we designed this system and the platform in such a way that the human component, medical doctor and nurses, can be balanced with the intervention of the virtual coach, so the virtual component, in such a way that human resources or virtual resources can be made available to the patients according to the specific step and specific need that that patient has in that, in that moment. And this is also in line with a broader patient-centric or patient-centered approach meaning personalized health. Uh, through this app is also possible for the medical doctor, but also for the patient, him or herself, to personalize the app. The medical doctor can decide what specific features can be applicable to that specific patient for, for that specific period of the disease. So he can decide what the, the amount and the type of data that the app can collect. And at the same time, in a view of a patient-centric approach, the patient himself or herself can uh, adapt and uh, select specific features of the, of the app to personalize the app according to his or her own specific needs. So the system is designed in such a way that we are able, through technology, to improve a personalization of the uh, healthcare delivery, considering the needs of the healthcare staff and the patient at the same at the same time, and this platform, the Track Diabetes platform, is not a standalone tool, but is integrated in a broader ecosystem, which is called Track. Uh, it, it's an acronym for the Clinical Citizen Record in Italy where each patient, each citizen can find different tools and different features that can support the patient across uh, his or her trajectory in terms of health or in terms of disease. And uh, what we are trying to uh, design here, it's a platform that can be fully integrated within the routine clinical pathway that we are currently offering to our patients with diabetes. And in fact, currently track diabetes is an app that can be prescribed by the medical doctor, ha has the medical doctor is prescribing uh, pills or visits, he or she can also prescribe an app as a part, as a standard part, standard component of the routine clinical pathway in such a way that also the uh, digital tools can be embedded within the uh, process of taking care of the patients and are also recognized by the public health sector as a valuable tool uh, that is part of the clinical pathway that is the standard pathway for our patients. So this is particularly important as we want to have a technology with fits with our organizational assets. So to, in our experience, this is clearly a core, a core issue to be, uh, to be faced and to be managed when including new technologies in a, in a um, patient-centric approach. And uh, I, I, I'm just about to, co to conclude my presentation. I want to stress that this platform uh, has been adopted and designed involving the patients. So we try to reflect and to promote 
um, public driven approach, but also a patient centric approach by involving patients and medical doctors in all the stages of the project since the co-designing of the platform and since the assessment that we are routinely doing in terms of patient provider relations and acceptability and usability of the of the platform itself. And I want to conclude by saying this, that this approach that we piloted and we are currently delivering for patients with diabetes is effective. We are gaining evidence that this approach is, is, is sustainable for our system and is also effective in managing patients. And in fact, we are uh, trying to expand this uh, centric approach uh, also to other diseases and to other patients, for instance, patients with a heart failure, and the system is proving to, to be effective also when translated, when transferred to other chronic diseases in particular. I, I think I finished my 10 minutes. Uh, if you have questions, of course, I will be happy. Uh, to to take them probably at the end of the of the webinar and now I'll, I'll leave the floor to my colleague from uh, for for the next uh, presentation thank you very much so um can you hear me Yes. Can you can. see my screen? Yes. Right. Thank you, Michelle, for your introduction. Thank you, Lorenzo, for keeping in time. I have a timer to be sure to keep my 10 minutes talk. Right. Let's start. I'm Massimiliano Petrelli. I'm a diabetologist at the regional hospital here in Ancona, Marche region and I'm a, a consultant for the regional health agency and I'm the responsible of the regional uh, diabetic network uh, I will introduce briefly. Uh, Marco region is a wonderful region on the east coast of Italy and as you see we have uh, a lot of people with age above uh, 65 years. We have everything have Tuscany but uh, we cost half price, so please visit Mark region. Um, as you see, the life expectancy is very high in Mark region, but what is more important is the healthy life expectancy that uh, is very high. We have uh, only Sweden and the province of Trento, my colleague uh, Lorenzo told you about that, that are better than we are. Uh, all we attended this uh, webinar know exactly what diabetes is, so I don't go into this slide, just to show you which is the prevalence in our region. Of course, uh, the problem of diabetes is not only acute complication, as we all, everybody knows, but long-term complication and costs are not uh, induced by devices uh, or diabetes drug, but uh, most of the costs are induced about uh, from uh, hospitalization and complication. So that's the focus we have to prevent. As you see, Marco region is pretty good if we compare to uh, the um, Italian average and uh, of, as well as consumption of uh, anti-diabetic drug, we are pretty clever as well as uh, the mortality in our region for diabetes is uh, less uh, than Italian average, both for male as well as female. Let's go into what is uh, the uh, regional uh, network. We started in 1987 with uh, a regional law, and then in 2012, we have the national plan for diabetes. Each region in Italy accepted the plan and starting to promote pro, to wrote down regional laws uh, deliberation and decrees uh, just to be more uh, centered on the regional needs 
we had the fortune at the end of 19 to have uh, a diabetologist, a physician, who was uh, very clever with computer. And he started to say, we need to put medical records in computerized form and include all patient data to manage them better. I know that is uh, sounds strange for other country, but uh, here in Italy, we take the uh, thing uh, slowly. And this is the timeline we had uh, in 1990, the development of this uh, software in this center. After 10 years, other seven centers adopted uh, the same software. And here, in 23 started the revolution they created a network and after these uh, all the centers uh, wanted uh, to uh, be connected uh, to this network and we achieved this uh, in the 2017 the stakeholder the stakeholders of course are healthcare professionals uh, as well as the university, scientific societies, private organization with some small contributes. And as Lorenzo said, it's very, very important to involve patients, patient association, when you build up something that is uh, new, that is a revolution. And we did it. Ethical aspects and equity, the services dealing with both prevention and chronicity management. World population is covered throughout the, the region. Costs are completely covered by the national health system, also through an exception code. Uh, the services covered the whole lifespan, support and guidance for the patient in care pathways and also other activities in school for the especially for diabetes type 1. In um, 2012 uh, market region with uh, the London School of Economics and Fondazione Mario Negri Sud uh, analyzed the data and uh, as you can see we have the average cost the annual cost for, for patients um, related to the A1C level. And as you can see here in this period, we were able, thanks to the network and thanks to this software, to improve our performance, increasing subjects with A1C below 7 and decreasing the percentage of subject with A1C above 8. This is uh, the network, uh, 15 centers for adults uh, plus one for children, uh, evenly distributed to the region and uh, easily accessible. All centers use the same shared electronic patient record uh, that is called Smart Digital Clinic by Meteda. Uh, with data flowing into a single regional database. The patient's documentation is accessible from all centers, allowing mobility through the region while guaranteeing data security and privacy. Each center is organized with a multidisciplinary team and is a person-centered care model. As Lorenzo said, this is the focus. And you can see in these um, slide uh, the staff and the activity. I briefly summarize with primary care and follow-up, chronic care, health promotion, for example, courses for correct diet and physical activity, correct use of diabetes devices, etc. This is prevention for diabetes and support to patients' associations activities. This is the pathway patient through specialist or the GP uh, come into the, the network. The diabetologist provide a diagnosis. So if uh, the patient is type 1 or type 2 with complication, will be follow up in the center and will be part of the network. If it's a simple type 2 on diet or simple oral 
therapy, he will go back to the GP, but uh, the connection between uh, GP and network is uh, always provided. As you can see, gestational diabetes have a peculiar pathway with a peculiar regional law with a peculiar exception code uh, because uh, is an increasing problem uh, we started to uh, analyze and to manage uh, the better we can. At the end of the day, we have uh, a doctor dashboard with summary data, alerts, monitoring of glucometer data, drug prescription, booking of other specialist services, and the same dashboard is uh, available for the patient on PC, or as you can see, the new of this year is on uh, a smartphone or tablet. And the patient have a look at the same summary data, alert, monitoring of glucometer uh, data, as well as advice from dietitian, physical activity, educational material, communication tool. This uh, dashboard is uh, set on the score queue. We have plenty of literature on the score queue that is basically 12 items out of the 77 indicators. And these items have the peculiar aspects that are important for the patient to check if his diabetologist is prescribing him the correct index for monitoring diabetes status, as well for the physician to check if the patient achieved the correct uh, number in these items. So it's a, a double check way, patient versus uh, uh, diabetologist and diabetologist versus uh, patient, that uh, is um, very effective. These are the results of 2019. Uh, as you can see, the number of patients is increasing, and I just point out uh, on these 13% uh, diabetic patient type 2 with par parameters completely normalized. Uh, would be nice to have all these patients with uh, these uh, um, with parameters completely normalized. That's uh, the I, uh, the focus for the next. Other activities carried out by centers, activities in schools, patient educational and the training operators, provision of device. Activities during the COVID, we were able to start immediately after the lockdown, the teleconsultation service carried out by all the center, avoiding cancellation or postponement of consultations, um, because we were already all in uh, a network. So patient from uh, every uh, city in the market, uh, the diabetology of that town had his data to check on, to contact the patient and to carry on his follow up. As well, it was important for identification of patient for the COVID vaccination. We, of course, uh, had some obstacles, uh, but we were able to overcome. The, there is no time to go through into each point, but, but as you can see, it was uh, very easy to resolve. The results are 28% reduction of hospital admission since the beginning of the network with improvement in quality of life uh, according to questionnaire from the patient and all the other results uh, you can see in this slide that I will provide you. And what about the cost? We have cost, but what is more important, and this is my last slide, is that in market region, we have an improvement of score coup of um, 5%. And this 5%, what does it mean? Means uh, 2 million euro total annual saving. So the successor factors were, were these. 
And the next step, integration with the single booking center, and we already done this, integration with the uh, electronic health record and testing. We are starting with uh, telemonitoring, video consulting, and testing artificial intelligence model for predicting the risk of complication. This is our next step. Thank you for your attention. Massimo and Lorenzo, thank you so much for two really insightful presentations and very complimentary around describing the role of digital and then your service model, uh, Massimo. So thank you so much. I'm sure we could spend the next 20 minutes and asking lots of questions, but I think um, it's fantastic to see your work presented here. So um, I'll just move us on, um, but hopefully we will still have time for some questions. Um, our next um, presentation is from Santiago Martinez, who is an Associate Professor at the University of Adgar in Norway. Santiago, over to you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Can you see my screen, my slides? And do they go forward? Yes. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to the M Health Hub for inviting me to give this talk. Dear speakers and dear audience, so my name is Santiago Martinez. I'm an associate professor in digital health at the University of Agder in Norway. I'm going to talk about collaborative approaches to user-centered design as an enabler for large-scale implementation. Lessons from Norway. So this is a brief summary of what I'm going to present today in this uh, 20 minutes talk. It will be a birth flight, just a nutshell, what we are doing here in Norway, particularly in the southern region of Agder. Mm -hmm. I'll talk a little bit about the um, Norwegian government strategy, more about the context, which is really important, information about the welfare technology program with a specific point on the digital home follow-up and then some conclusions. The first part was to talk a little bit about the strategy and plan that the Norwegian government has in place. I selected here on the left just two documents, the national health strategy for 2017-2022 and the plan. And those are um, issued by the Norwegian Directorate of Health, of eHealth, sorry, that together with the Directorate of Health depend from the Norwegian Ministry of Health. They have six main pillars or focus areas. The first one is the digitization of work processes that focus on the modernization of the journal and the medication change, chain, sorry. The second one is the better coherence inpatient processes that focus on the continuity of care and sharing responsibilities, also sharing up medication information. The third pillar is a better use of health data for treatments and improving secondary purposes. The fourth one is health help in new ways to facilitate for the citizen and stimulate innovation and remote health care, which became very important with the pandemic. The fifth one is the common foundation for digital services to develop building blocks. And the sixth is the national management of e-health and increase implementation capacity. And that touches upon the topic today. So they are creating a national supply force, uh, strengthening the work um, and the, the gains that they have achieved throughout these years, and also the preparation, the information security and the privacy. User participation is vital. These are not my words. This was written by Bent Höje, which is the Norwegian Health Minister. And I translate here because this is Norwegian. It was written as part of the Norwegian Hospital Plan for 2020-2030. User participation is vital. Being listened to confirms that you are worth something. It has both an intrinsic value and a therapeutic value. If patients are allowed to influence their own treatment, they are confirmed as people who have capacity and know and count. I think that's an interesting quote to think about related to the topic today. So preparing the presentation, I was thinking, how, how can I introduce the context? And one of the first ideas that came to my mind is this well, um, uh, constellation of different devices that diabetes patients face. And I think that shows a little bit the complexity 
uh, not only about the literacy, but also how they can interact, understand, Santiago, I think you're on mute. You've slipped yeah. in. Yeah. He's reached off his microphone. <laughs> Santiago, can you hear us? Hello, can you hear That's me? it. Thank you. You're back. Oh, boy, guys. <laughs> Not at all. Thank you. When did I <laughs> stop? I don't know how it happened, by the way. I must have just flicked on. I think, yeah. Um, you were describing the slide with the um, technologies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Well, to summarize, the challenges here that the, the users may face regarding literacy, but also contacting other health professionals, etc. Santiago, can you share your slides again? I think they've dropped too because of the okay. connection. Okay, apologize for all this. Are they back? They are back. Good. Well, I'm going to try not to touch anything. I don't know what is <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, thank you. So we're back to the context. Um, political and administrative, it's quite important here before we go into the main topic, which is Norway has 5.4 million inhabitants, but very importantly, uh, they have more than 350 municipalities and they have the responsibility for primary healthcare services. It's also important because more than half of the municipalities have less than 5,000 inhabitants and 16 more than 15, 50,000. And why is this important? Because the number of inhabitants determines the budget. And that's quite important when we are talking about the health and developing sustainable healthcare services. So today we'll focus on Agder, on this region with 25 municipalities, a little bit more than 300,000 inhabitants, 300 GPs, and where the Southern Norwegian Hospital is distributed among three different cities, Arendal, Kristiansand, and Flekefjord. Um, I mentioned about the Welfare Technology Program, which, as it says here, can provide great benefits and helps municipalities to implement welfare technology services. What are these welfare technology services? They are related to all the services you can think of that you can have at home, from alarms to patient monitoring and follow-up. And again, this program is supported by the Health Directorate, the Norwegian Directorate of eHealth, and this organization, this umbrella organization for all these municipalities called KS. And just to highlight the fact that almost all the municipalities in Norway are uh, um, using these welfare technology solutions as part of the program. So I'm going to focus on one part of this program, which is the welfare technology, the digital home follow up, which was trialed between 2018 and 2021, tested and evaluated across 10 municipalities, and some of them were in the Agdo region. The other two uh, legs of this welfare technology program are welfare technology for children and young people with disabilities and development and testing of technological tools to mobilize against loneliness among the elderly. But I will just focus for the sake of time just only on the first part. So what was this uh, digital home follow up? Well, the target group were patients with chronic diseases at the risk of worsening their condition and hospitalization who have an increased need for health and care services. And here we are talking about diabetes, of course, but also cardiovascular disease, cancer, mental disorders, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And it's GP driven. So the GPs must assess the need and propose a digital home follow up where it is medically justifiable. It's a very important point. And this also takes place in consultation with the municip municipal healthcare service the specialist healthcare service and the patient. So here is the first step where the patient starts having a very important role. And of course, the treatment uh, will be included uh, as part of the treatment plan. The key performance indicators here are focused on self-management, physical and mental health, patient experience and cost. And the output informs back the, the, this national uh, welfare technology program. This, this initiative is based on building blocks. It started with European funding, actually, with a European project called United for Health, 
from 2013 until 2016, where we started co-designing with users, the same as in Italy, with patients and uh, relatives and healthcare professionals, nurses and doctors from all the path of clinical pathway to design this um, mobile healthcare service for them and monitoring and follow up. And that was followed up by this Telma project, which is this joint telemedicine solution in Agger, distant follow up for people with chronic illness. So this makes the region Agder a very um, interesting region for the rest of the country. It's a reference region in terms of what is going on, what is happening in the region regarding this um, welfare technology program. What about the models? Well, I simplify in two slides, but basically there is this um, model between the telehealth center and municipal healthcare services, which they take care of mapping the user needs for follow up training the users in the use of their device and managing their disease and also the continuous monitoring and follow up. And this happens between the telehealth center and municipal services. Sometimes uh, the municipal service uh, requests the, the help of the telehealth center and so forth. It's balanced between the two. And what about the hospital? Well, here is, is model is the same model, but it has a little bit more, more steps where, for example, there is an example here that John 62 has diabetes, he's included and receives training in digital home follow-up from the hospital, and then he's transferred to the telemedicine center or telehealth center, which take over the follow-up responsibility, this is very important, for John. Then John will uh, use their own device, tablet or phone to fill up different questionnaires and, and yeah, measures and take measures as well. Those are reported back and there is a triage, and in case of an alarm, GP or a specialist can be included in the loop. So this is a simplification of the models. I can give more information, but for the sake of time, I just stick to these uh, explanations. Very important, the evaluation. This is one of the strong points here, keeping in mind that Norway is a country of 5.4 million inhabitants. So this particular um, uh, initiative in Agder, keep in mind there were other municipalities in other regions, included around 150 patients with more than 100 in the intervention group and more than 40 in the control group. And I just highlighted some of the outcomes of that evaluation. So in terms of the service use, the intervention group with the baseline, like no measures, was around 93 minutes, but it decreased to 80 minutes after they took six measurements. While in the Control group, the survey use had an average increment of 24 minutes. And of course, that has consequences for the healthcare services and the resources used. We also measured the patient satisfaction in a scale from one to five. And importantly, it increased satisfactorily after one year. It was positive from the beginning, 4.1, but also after a year, there was a positive increment to 4.3. And the last point, it was something unplanned, but the um, service allowed for the development of an add-on ad hoc uh, for a COVID uh, functionality, which was really successful. And it was actually the first in Norway, and it allowed to follow COVID patients at home, which all the um, positive uh, impact that it has for infection control and et cetera. Success factors, just to name a few, champions in each municipality, collaborating teams around the patient, to understand that they all are part of a team, so they all share goals, focus across silos. We know very much, very well, that there are many silos, in the, especially in the healthcare sector. Having a special focus across them is really important. The concept of individual follow-up that the uh, multidisciplinary team allows. Also important to focus on the knowledge and competence, the exp expertise that is using that follow-up cooperation with the supplier and providers from the first minute, also very important, providing a good customer support for all the sites, clear task and division of responsibilities, which touches upon accountability model, which is really important. And last but not least, the benefit realization perspective, which requires typically a little bit more time. It's not just short term, it's usually middle term, but impacts very positively on patients and therefore on the, on the quality of healthcare services. 
and just a nutshell, this is in Norwegian, but I don't think in this translation, just to give you a, 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 a shot of, of this long-term perspective that they have in Agri, where we started with a European project, then it was followed by another project, and now there is a, a established healthcare services, and the projection in time, the planning goes to 2024 and ahead. I don't want to forget other initiatives in Norway, because this was just a, a, a picture of, of one of them, uh, in the Norwegian uh, Center for eHealth Research, based in Tromsø in the north, they have this this project called 3P: Patients and Professionals in Partnership, which is this idea about a multidisciplinary uh, team uh, following up the patient, and is based on the chronic care model. And the the diabetes um, uh, research group, also based in in, in the same center, lead, led by the prof professor Eric Orson who also is a diabetic uh, patient. And just to finalize, um, to go through the conclusions, very important uh, when doing co-design, user involvement and collaborative approaches, including the whole chain um, from local, regional, national, and also sometimes European authorities, policymakers, politicians, etc. We, for example, we started with European funding, so we went the other way around, but it's, it can be bidirectional. We talk about government, but we should not forget about governance, who uh, governs the data, but also the information mm -hmm. and the knowledge, which is quite important in healthcare settings. To involve all the stakeholders is possible, but it would be impossible without a structure and an infrastructure in place. So the logistics, the regulations should be in place before it happens. So there is a lot of planning before you gather around the table, nurses, doctors and patients. And that has to be with yeah, community building, establishing relationships and, and a good rapport with the stakeholders. And the last point about the different perspectives, which is typically one of the points I hear the most when we talk about uh, user involvement. We need to be able, and it's possible, uh, to combine different uh, interests because we have different stakeholders around the table, but at the same time, finding common synergies there, shared goals, how we can navigate short versus long time perspectives. I gave some hints today, the industry, the municipal, the hospital, but also the citizens who have human rights connected to health. Cost effectiveness really important for the sustainability of the services, but also keeping a door open for the middle and perhaps a bit longer term uh, connected to the benefit realization, which I also, I hope I gave some hints today. That's everything from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Santiago. Fantastic. And on time. Very impressed. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's incredibly, um, I think, insightful to see the central role that personalised care is having in policy in Norway. And I think that's certainly something that Scotland's um, aspiring to in a similar vein. So it's fantastic to hear that work being progressed and, and the fantastic work you and the university are progressing. So to our final presentation today, last but not least, um, I'm delighted to introduce Magdalena, um, who many of you will know already, and Dr Estevan Kosa, who will be describing an overview of the uh, knowledge tool uh, for diabetes and scale up in Hungary. So over to you both. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you for uh, uh, the invitation. It is a privilege for me to share the work that we developed uh, in the to, in the KT2 uh, mobile tab with the collaboration of uh, other part partners, and especially uh, I would like to mention Professor Patrick Eklund from Mea University, who is a mathematician who gave a, a key contribution to the work you you will see. Um, uh, what we did in the, the mobile tab uh, developed the efforts uh, to uh, generate, to design three knowledge tools 
one uh, focusing on assessment frameworks, another one on integrating and scaling up mobile health solutions within health systems. And we have then the KT2 tool, the one we will focus on today, that has been uh, uh, trying to develop uh, a tool focused on uh, uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And the objectives of this uh, tool uh, have been to set up a user-friendly way to provide navigation uh, uh, in, the, in the many tools uh, available for uh, uh, diabetes uh, mobile health, generating also a catalog of mobile health solutions and uh, set up a, a guidance to identify the solutions that are more suitable for a specific uh, um, setting to develop a large scale mobile health program. The approach we, uh, we designed and implemented uh, started out with the country specification, taking into account multidimensional situation and its analysis that uh, brought us to design uh, personal use cases and service scenario and on the other side uh, on the identification of solution building blocks that could feed into the algorithm and support the match between uh, solutions and uh, needs that were personalized. Uh, the, the methodology that we implemented uh, to identify uh, the needs, uh, we, we brought from, we, uh, uh, we uh, took from the blueprint on digital transformation of health and care that uh, uh, was developed the, uh, along, that allowed the identification of a specific uh, cluster of needs based on real profiles of groups of patients that uh, was developed along two dimensions, the life course and the intensity of needs of a specific uh, uh, person's profiles. And uh, these personas facilitated the design of person-centered service scenarios that were taking into account not only physical needs of patients, but also the other needs uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, place where they live, uh, uh, working age or other needs related to the, to the, to the life, uh, life, place, life uh, age, and uh, uh, also to the social uh, setting where uh, their needs was uh, being to be to be addressed, and uh, um, this uh, uh, service scenario uh, also facilitated to take it, uh, us facilitated us to take into account all the elements that uh, um, make the uh, the value chain of health and go from a health promotion, this is prevention, diagnosis, treatment, rehabilitation and long-term care, uh, the primary activities in each care system and all the, the secondary and support activities required to integrate and implement this person-centered service provision. The other element we, uh, we, that, uh, uh, we um, developed in our approach was uh, uh, focusing on the building blocks of the solutions available. And we used the, the WHO classification on digital health intervention to categorize the solutions along four main groups. And we also introduced a new group, new group that is including uh, the added value features such as interoperability, training, digital literacy, and other elements. <coughs> Then we focused on how to, uh, to uh, categorize the needs that we identified in the personas and we uh, used the, the, the functionality codes, the ICF, ICF codes, so that we could take into account environmental factors and the personal factors that uh, play a key role in uh, defining the needs of a person of a person centered approach and could facilitate the identification of one or more solutions to address such needs i would like to invite uh, uh, isman to comment on the use of this uh, approach of icf codes isman uh -huh. Uh, hello, thank you uh, for the possibility to comment it. Uh, but I mentioned uh, uh, to Madeleine earlier that uh, 
ICF codes, uh, this function code is uh, not so widely used uh, in the health care service. Uh, we pre predominantly use the international classification of diseases codes uh, and determine the presence of uh, diabetes or coronary artery disease, etc. And uh, uh, the functional codes are, uh, at least in our country, used only in the re rehabilitation setting. So I personally, working in a cardiac rehabilitation center, I am familiar with this code, but uh, it's not so widely used in, in other. Thank, thank you, Isemana. This is very important because why, when we develop these models, we need to take into account that uh, there are a number of uh, other activities that spin off from our models, so we should try to support uh, and uh, to ensure that the models are possibly adopted and implemented. So uh, we then, uh, as I mentioned, we focused on these ICF codes that provide the, uh, this is a specific courses. So we retrieved from the ICF codes the course for diabetes, and we chose uh, the categories uh, that were applicable to our case. And this was done at the same time we were developing with the Esteban uh, a, a customized persona that is Janos. And we, uh, at the end, we found out that Janos is also obese. So there is the multimorbidity appearing, and there is a new challenge that uh, uh, can be a better approached if we use multiple courses uh, and ICF code set. So there is further developments needed to complete the work. The input to the service process for KT2 is provided uh, by persona needs and country needs, and uh, the other input is represented by solutions that can be retrieved by several repositories where solutions are already uh, uh, available and concentrated. The algorithm provides a match, identifies one or more solutions that can potentially address the needs combined uh, by, by the algorithm. And uh, we will uh, we, we see a stratification uh, in terms of, uh, of maturity of the solutions we, we identify. This doesn't mean the solutions are less or more interesting because all solutions are interesting. Indeed, uh, early development cutting-edge solutions that are probably the less mature are very interesting, for example, for uh, university hospitals who have a very clear uh, vocation to implement and broaden the validation of very new solutions. So there is an interest for all kinds of, of solutions that may emerge from uh, uh, the algorithm matching. The, so the, summarizing what, the, the, what are the features of KT2, KT2 supports the match of needs with the personalized needs with one or more solution and according to a person-centered approach that is uh, supported by selected ICF code for specific disease. The solutions that uh, flow into the algorithm are self-assessed by providers and the assessment is evidence-based. And we also uh, proposed a uh, semantic of the stars to uh, to categorize the emerging uh, uh, match. And uh, uh, it's very important to highlight that the result of zero is no less important. Actually, it's important because it identifies a gap in the solutions that can be addressed by further research. So any, so any result of the algorithm is interesting for a different segment of uh, exploitation. So I leave the word to Isema for the second part of the talk. Isteban, just let me know when you want me to go on with the slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I should say some words about my, uh, myself. I, I am a physician uh, working at the uh, Cardiac Rehabilitation Center and I am also responsible for the heading of the uh, preventive medicine department at the uh, Medical University of Segal and I am responsible for the medical coordination of the uh, telemedicine uh, services at the uh, National Director General of Hospitals. So uh, this this is uh, my uh, background, and uh, uh, I worked earlier also for the Council of the Health Management and uh, Health Informatics. Also, my view is uh, my point of view is uh, originates from uh, this uh, this background. Uh, first of all, some words about uh, the, the Hungarian uh, situation. Uh, you, sh you should know that uh, the Hungarian 
uh, with a, a single insurance uh, model, which is relatively uh, inflexible. So it's not so easy to implement innovative technology in uh, this uh, environment. Uh, it's that the uh, healthcare financing uh, was very well developed uh, three decades ago. Uh, Hungary was between the first introducing the DRG system, the, the fee-for-service so-called German point-based uh, outpatient uh, financing system uh, in the healthcare. But during the uh, next uh, two, three decades, uh, uh, the development of the healthcare funding uh, uh, was, was slowed uh, down. Okay, I, I have the next uh, slide, Madalena. Thank you. Uh, and uh, as uh, as uh, in the majority of the Western uh, countries, uh, the healthcare is dominated by the, uh, medicative treatment types. Uh, so we spend a lot of our budget for the drugs uh, and also for the hospital cares uh, and uh, uh, the. Uh, prevention uh, is uh, present as a theoretical approach, uh, but uh, in the practice, we spend relatively a small amount uh, of our healthcare budgets for the uh, preventive uh, purposes. Uh, what we spend uh, uh, is it is going out uh, for screening, uh, but the end effect of screening is very frequently the medicalization uh, of the intervention. It, it means we try to uh, to uh, intervene uh, the patient with different further diagnostic tools, prescribes uh, drugs, and uh, sometimes we spend them uh, also uh, to uh, to invasive diagnostic and inv invasive uh, treatment. Uh, and uh, this is a special uh, problem in, in the case of a lifestyle related uh, diseases uh, as, uh, or dysfunction like obesity or diabetes and uh, prediabetes hypertension, which can be very well uh, uh, treated with lifestyle intervention. And uh, this, this was for the medical side. And, uh, uh, OK, it, it, uh, the next slide was. Uh, appropriate. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the consequence of this single insurance uh, financing model for the Hungarian healthcare. Uh, uh, by uh, the the intervention is uh, relatively by our relatively inflexible. Uh, the system based uh, development is relatively uh, uh, good. It, it's uh, uh, we have a really well uh, developed uh, uh, e-health infrastructure here in Hungary. Uh, uh, all the medical reports are already available for every uh, uh, physicians uh, since uh, 2017, and uh, since the last year already in the uh, private care. Uh, served patients reports are also available in this system. And uh, recently, uh, uh, introduction or implementation of the personal health record was also performed. Uh, theoretically, the first system set, set, uh, tests were already uh, performed. OK, the next slide. And uh, there are also uh, projects uh, in progress uh, on the field of uh, healthcare uh, financing, uh, uh, LU supported the local uh, WHO office uh, had its uh, project uh, try to test the utilization, uh, the suitability of uh, new financing uh, model. Uh, first of all, uh, the application applicability of uh, bundle payment for for services overarching different uh, service types like inpatient home care or outpatient uh, care. And uh, I, I believe uh, our approach uh, when we try to to uh, to initiate uh, the, the management of, of uh, diabetes or pre-diabetes patient in an outpatient or eventually in uh, inpatient environment, and then we would like to follow this patient uh, in uh, his her home. It is a very good uh, uh, candidate uh, for such new models. Next slide. And uh, then we really uh, generated uh, together with Madalena uh, this uh, uh, persona uh, called Janos, uh, uh, who is 
uh, typical working age uh, man uh, with uh, uh, the typical uh, low level of uh, physical activity, but of course with some overweight uh, due to irregularity of his uh, nutritional habits, uh, uh, it is very hard for this person to, to change his uh, lifestyle around. Uh, he is already at the state uh, when uh, the first uh, uh, drug treatment should be initiated and we should calculate that within uh, decades he uh, will receive also insulin treatment and uh, uh, we know if we are effective uh, with the lifestyle support of uh, this patient, uh, the future uh, will be much better than uh, without uh, such support. Next slide. Uh, I mentioned I am a cardiologist and uh, uh, I am keen for uh, the, the results of the uh, uh, cardiac uh, patient. And this is also very relevant in the case of a diabetic uh, patient. Uh, probably um, uh, many of uh, you heard already about the CARIT uh, study, which demonstrated almost uh, one decade ago uh, the uh, ineffectiveness of uh, 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 percutaneous uh, treatment of uh, stable uh, angina uh, patients. And uh, it was recently uh, published at the re-evaluation of uh, this study, it's demonstrated that uh, while the uh, percutaneous, uh, percutaneous uh, intervention doesn't improve the survival of the patients, uh, uh, when they uh, uh, try to uh, control the risk factor uh, of this patient group, uh, our result is excellent and uh, we can reduce uh, uh, about 50% the uh, uh, risk uh, of uh, the, this patient uh, and here we should focus on the uh, smoking status of the patient, the physical activity status and, uh, and the uh, diet status of this uh, patient. Of course, the blood pressure, the lipid profile uh, and uh, the uh, uh, metabolic status should also be controlled. Next slide. And our approach is uh, to, to try to develop a, a system uh, which supports uh, uh, the patient uh, for a long last uh, on the way of the uh, lifestyle uh, uh, change. Uh, uh, we try to uh, use the, uh, the heart rate monitors uh, available in the uh, in, in the uh, wellness uh, markets, uh, we are, are using uh, uh, heart rate monitors uh, like uh, offered uh, by uh, the Polar, and uh, uh, these these devices are uh, ready uh, with uh, free to download uh, apps, and uh, uh, the data can be. Uh, coached from from distance uh, through the uh, cloud of uh, the company and uh, we have also a uh, 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 possibility to uh, to depict uh, the nutritional habit of the patient and this is a uh, uh, application developed at uh, Hungarian University uh, here, our neighborhood in West Prem at the University of Pan Pannonia, which uh, adopt the Hungarian uh, uh, nutritional habits and uh, give a, a quick uh, feedback for the patient about the utilization of energy, uh, uh, carbohydrates, uh, protein and fats uh, through the daily intake. And the next uh, slide. Uh, but what was uh, what the University of Szeged uh, uh, co-workers developed, and uh, this is a surface uh, which integrates uh, the the results from the different uh, vendors, uh, so we can uh, get an overview about uh, the last weeks or last months of uh, our uh, patient, uh, uh, where the uh, nutritional data, the physical activity. Data and uh, if uh, 
uh, uh, I, I could show you also uh, that uh, the uh, blood glucose uh, data, as well as the insulin uh, utilization data, can be de depicted uh, simultaneously and uh, can be uh, handled, can be managed uh, uh, at once. The next slide. Uh, our goal is uh, to generate a, a system uh, which has a high patient uh, acceptance rates. Uh, the majority of the patients uh, should accept and perform the whole intervention. We plan to perform it at least uh, for three months, but I believe it would be nice to, to go further uh, with the coaching of the patients. Uh, we see already uh, that uh, simple the the uh, cardiac training uh, coaching is very effective. Uh, its result already in, in the reduction of the waist circumference, the fasting blood glucose, the uh, blood triglyceride level, and the increase of high density cholesterol level. Uh, we hope if uh, uh, our approach will integrate also the, the diet side, uh, it will be more uh, effective. And the last, uh, I think, uh, the key element that uh, we should uh, develop a, a clear plan for the whole whole country, which involve the promotion of the lifestyle change. It's a very, uh, very hard work. Uh, we, we should uh, emphasize that uh, uh, this is a similar specialty as the surge surgery or uh, the it's at the cardiology, it's not so uh, easy. We should spend much more uh, resources for the promotion of uh, lifestyle uh, changes. And uh, of course, we, we should apply uh, appropriate uh, financing system, uh, which allow us to plan for a long uh, run. I, I believe uh, 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 when we are uh using only project for such purposes it uh, will not be satisfied the projects and always we should find a solution where the effective uh, uh, project can be survived without further decision and i believe uh, it is at least of uh, important to handle the long run fi financing uh, uh i believe uh such integrated care model can guarantee a very good outcome for the patients and uh, it is reasonable to to buy uh, this uh, outcome uh, with a uh, bundled financing or a similar model thank you uh, i think this was my part thank you very much it's fantastic thank you very much i thought you're presentation was very helpful giving a methodological overview of the tool and then that real world experience which is certainly what what we're keen to get out of today's session so thank you to all our speakers um now happy to say that we're going to move into our discussion and question section so i hope everyone is ready with their questions um i'll just check with the organizers i think we have around 30 minutes available left for this slot um, and we will um, move forward with that. Um, so I think what would be helpful is if anyone who again just wants to ask a question from our participants today, if you can raise your hand or pop your question in the chat, I'll be happy to address them to our speakers. If all our presenters today can also turn their camera on, that would be helpful. So we'll have almost like a virtual panel here of um, of mugshots so we can see who everyone is and we can address all that so one if there's any no if there's any pressing questions i certainly have a few that i would like to start with uh, so perhaps i can warm up the discussions my first question i'd like to ask is to ozan if ozan's still with us yes yes i am yeah. i'm here Hi, great. Thanks again. Hosanne, what struck me really was that the procurement process is likely to be one of the most challenging, I think, we've all experienced when we're looking at implementation at scale. And what your work's clearly demonstrated is that it's, it's hugely effective to use these new approaches these um, innovative approaches, because I think what they do is they address this difference between 
the, the risk sharing element between the procurer and supplier. Mm -hmm. I suppose what I'm interested in is um, why is why are these approaches still quite underutilised in Europe in the UK? And I'd welcome your sort of thoughts on why that is, because we're certainly keen, I think, across the UK and Europe to try and push forward these new innovative approaches. Why do you think they have been underutilised and what more could we do uh, to try and push them forward as they're clearly an effective route to procurement? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question, um, Michelle. I think that's a very good question. As far as I know, the uh, innovation procurement tools have been in use since 2006. At least that's the time when the EC rolled out these um, uh, procurement tools, namely PC, uh, PCP, pre-commercial pro uh, procurement, mm -hmm. and PPI, uh, public procurement of innovation. Um, they are very good tools, uh, but one of the drawbacks is that you are not only procuring the technology but you're procuring the rmd process itself and it brings its pros and cons with it you are um you are purchasing you're procuring the rmd service and uh, you are sharing the risks with the suppliers your challenge is not met you're proving that your challenge is not met therefore what you are looking for is not in the market yet Mm -hmm. I believe that's one of the main reasons it's not these kinds of uh, procurement tools uh, are not widely used. But one of the pros, um, one of the very good pros is that with these tools, you're able to procure something that is tailored for you. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. And I believe we will be, uh, Prem Power was our first PCP. Uh, now we are doing another um, HS monitor for hypertension uh, self-management, and now we are we are in uh, we are a partner in other PCP to in care heart for um, chronic heart uh, failure self-management. So once you know the tool, you start enjoying it because <laughs> yeah, you um, start. Um, getting more benefit from it. So the more you use the tool, the more you uh, become familiar with it. I believe you will start using it more. Thank you, excellent. Mm -hmm. And just, can I ask, did you involve any citizens in the procurement process? Not in the procurement process itself from the legal uh, and procurement point of view, but we did include uh, end users even from the beginning of the project, even from the requirement analysis, field studies, uh, formation of the so-called challenge brief document, and then we included end users um, from the earliest phases of the solution development. They Thank were you. presented. They were presented the uh, prototypes, and they gave their feedbacks so that the solutions were developed accordingly. Excellent. Thank you, Ozan. Thank, Thank you. you. We have a, a question in the chat for Massimiliano. Um, I'm not sure if you're able to read that. Um, Massimo, are you able to read that or shall I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Michelle. Yeah. Thank you. And my name is very simple. It's Maximilian. It's Maximilian. <laughs> well, it looks apologies. strange, but it's just the Italian <laughs> translation of Maximilian. So, And yeah. for for my friend, is Max, because Maximilian is too long, so it's just Max. I like Max, I like Max. <laughs> I like Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, yes, uh, so the, the question is, um, I shown that uh, my system started by a clinician who was particularly sk skilled in technologies. How did uh, I develop the training of professional nurses, especially in my network? Uh, well, it's um, very easy because uh, we had uh, and we still have uh, courses uh, every single time you have uh, a news, uh, a new tool or everything that can change the system, we have uh, um, a course. Sometimes is a regional course, sometimes is a point to point course, uh, and that's the way to keep uh, all uh, the people involved uh, able uh, to use uh, this network at 100%. Excellent, thank you. 
Um, Santiago, I have a question for, for you, if that's OK. Um, I'm really interested to hear more about um, how Norway are exploring sort of user design approach to address digital inclusion. So I'm very interested in whether you think that um, user design can bridge the divide, because I think that you know digital inclusion is a challenge for us all when we're implementing the solutions at scale. So I'd welcome your reflections on that and how we how we oversee that problem. Thank you, Michelle, for your question. Yes, absolutely. Um, and this is part of the work we are doing with the University of Strathclyde, actually, there in Scotland, digital inclusion. Uh, it, can be quite surprising, but in Norway, close to 600,000 people are not online. And this is kind of recent news that uh, was making the news just one week ago. So there are, um, it has now been putting into the main agenda of this uh, directorate for uh, e-health and for health. So there are some movements at the higher top level and the Norwegian Research Council is preparing a new call just to address uh, digital inclusion at this level. OK, so do you think that we will be able to address this with design approaches or do you think that we'll need a lot more strategic policy or? Well, I, I think it has to be an integrated approach. So we need uh -huh. to involve from the very bottom up to the top. Uh, it's very important when we talk about low literacy skills to have didactic programs in place. And for that, we need to involve not just the target group, but also those people who are able to design this type of interventions in a successful way. Thank you, thank you. So we have no questions in the chat, so I'm afraid it's more from questions from me. Um, Lorenzo, um, I wondered if I could bring you in here, you and Max. Um, I wondered if you could describe a little about, you're obviously public bodies, and I wanted to understand a bit more about how, with your work, you engage with industry. So what mechanisms do you use to engage? Is it collaboration agreements, or how, what's the approaches you've used to engage with industry for the successful outcome of your work? Okay, I can go first, probably. Sorry, I'm wearing the mask as I'm in a room with other colleagues. Yeah. Um, well, in our case, the example that I was um, presenting uh, before, the, the industry is actually uh, the group of stakeholders that I presented, mm -hmm. meaning that, and this is a, a really, um, public health approach in our case, in the sense that even the app has been developed by the Bruno Kessler Foundation. So everything was made by public health uh, institutions, from the design to uh, the development and the fine tuning of the of the app itself. So in our case, we can we can say that it's a it's a product that is fully made by public health institutions and this is probably the added value also in, in the case of our experience. I have to say that anyway this is not enough of course as technology is really running and changing every day so it is important that it's part of our strategic plan to involve also the private sector that can contribute in speeding up the process of developing and integrating new technologies under the umbrella of a public health perspective. In our approach, the public health sector is anyway leading the, the process in terms of setting up priorities and it can assign to specific public, to specific private sectors specific tasks and to, de to develop a specific component that can be uh, included in the ecosystem that I was showing in my slide. So I think that probably a mixed approach, public health and private sector is probably the, the best option, probably the unique option mm -hmm. to be able to deal with the uh, really fast development of technological solutions so the public health sector could be able to take <coughs> the best options available on the market and to integrate the options that fits with the public health priorities and with the patient needs rather than the industry needs. Yeah. Thank you. Max, I think you're on mute. 
Thank you, Michelle. You're Thank right. You. Uh, as I shown in my in my slides, uh, there were and there is still a, a small contribution from um, industries in this network. Uh, in the beginning, it started uh, with an interest because uh, if you had a look, uh, all that companies are companies that produce glucometer. So the interest was. Uh, to transfer data from glucometer directly into the file, into the record of the patient, into the new software, just to have uh, uh, everything in there, everything digitalized. And uh, believe me, in the 90s, in the early 20s, this was uh, a real uh, revolution. Now everything <laughs> works like that, I know, but in the beginning was uh, uh, a revolution and uh, now in the beginning was with wire of course now it's wireless using clouds uh, and uh, that was uh, especially important during the covid lockdown because we were able to to see uh, data directly into the record of that patient and collect the data directly into his record and non using other tools or other uh, networks <laughs> to collect data. Uh, the future is um, the Meteda company that, uh, as you saw, uh, is involved in other project. Uh, also, our colleague from Turkey shown uh, the name Meteda SSRL and uh, started from this uh, experiment in our region now, they are providing the software all around Italy and, are, and they are now expanding through Europe. Mm -hmm. And so this is uh, an evolving process. Um, in the beginning uh, was something uh, close to the diabetologist interest. And as uh, Lorenzo told, after that, uh, the public uh, regional system saw this system. Uh, so, sorry, the public uh, regional uh, health care uh, saw this system and they became in, interested in it and now they acquired part of it just to improving uh, the social aspect uh, and not only commercial. I don't know if I answered your question. But. Oh. Thank you. No, that's really helpful. It's an Thank overview. You. It's an overview. <laughs> yeah, of course. I could speak, I could speak hours and hours. <laughs> no, it sounds like the, the thalamic networks are hugely valuable to this work. So that's fantastic. Um, Estefan, I wonder if I can come to you, please. Um, so a key part of your presentation focused on around needing to adapt healthy lifestyles to improve outcome. Yeah. So. What do you think could, you alluded to some of this in your sort of reflections, what do you think could be done more at a national level to really look at how we could address the approach of more innovative solutions to addressing some of the prevention and lifestyle challenges we have? Do we need to see changes in public policy? Do we need planning? Can you say a bit more about what you think could be done more at a national level? Uh, I think, uh... Uh, first of all, uh, we should accept uh, lifestyle changing as an important part uh, of our uh, health service uh, beca because uh, uh, there is a small part of the population who itself try to adjust uh, his or uh, lifestyle. First of all, the the younger uh, people, more educated uh, people, but uh, this is not present uh, in the whole population. And uh, it, it is very important that uh, we should uh, should uh, uh, allocate a, a considerable part of our healthcare budget uh, for uh, this area. And I'm sure that uh, uh, we, sh uh, we should develop uh, methods uh, which are capable to adjust the lifestyle of the patient, uh, but uh, it uh, should not be a medicalized uh, solution. Uh, I believe we, we should integrate uh, the uh, the uh, uh, markets player also in, in this uh, process. Uh, we, uh, we should uh, 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 integrate also uh, the patient organization in, in this process and uh, 
uh, what is important, uh, this should reach the outcome. And uh, I, I think uh, the whole healthcare sector tried to go uh, from the the output based uh, uh, financing to where the outcome based mm -hmm. financing and uh, uh, if you are able to utilize uh, uh, lifestyle change related uh, improvement you should finance it uh, independent uh, of the market player it, it means uh, independent of the medical or uh, uh, the private uh, sector okay mm -hmm. Thank you, that's helpful. This is a question just um, to you all really. I suppose I'm interested in how do we empower our citizens to be more proactive in asking for access to digital tools and services because our citizens do have a voice and I'd really like any reflections from the panel as to how we can be more proactive in supporting and enabling our um, citizens to do this. If I may share my experience, I think that uh, we should uh, um, make an effort and go closer to the citizen. This means uh, uh, virtually and physically. Probably the best uh, innovative approach is move from uh, the hospital, but the hospital are uh, medicalized. So in line with, with Isteman, what Isteman says, we should strengthen our interaction with non-profit organizations, patients organizations, community organization because there is a, a socio-cultural adaptation that can be the attractor towards the new tools. It's not only what you present but also how you explain it uh, to people and also so we can uh, share our international good practices with a socio-cultural local interface probably. Thank you. Any other comments? Reflections. <laughs> Thank you all. So I suppose we, if there are no any other further questions, I suppose I just thought I'd bring together some final thoughts. Um, what's been really interesting, I think, for me across all the presentations today is there's an emerging theme here where I think we could start to look at the opportunity about developing indicators for outcomes and successful indicators and I know that there's been some so some discussion and we've seen some of that reflected in some of the presentations today and I'm interested as to whether the, the panel's views on whether developing an, a set of indicators, a toolkit, something that would help us capture this learning would be a useful um, objective, something for the hub to do and also would it be a useful topic for a future uh, workshop where we use each of your presentations to try and drill down to what have been the key indicators for success and use that as a starting point to allow us to kind of capture. The indicators are wide, we know technological, organisational, behavioural, lots of indicators, but I do think this could be the really start of a really interesting piece of work for the Hub. Um, but I'd like to ask the panel members if they think that would be a useful tool and a useful uh, next workshop for us to focus on. Mike? Uh, absolutely, I, I do agree. I think it's really a key point, particularly as you said, if we are able to reflect all and translate all the experiences into a set of multi-layer indicators, as you said, and this probably is also an answer to the question that you that you were asking before, how to involve and how to really expand our experiences. We know that promoting telemedicine, it's, it's quite a complex matter mm -hmm. and I totally agree with you that a multi-layer strategy also to assess and to evaluate what is working and what is not working is absolutely key, starting from a very technical viewpoint until a macro political level that also should be taken into account in order to promote effective strategies in mobile health. So I, I'm totally in favor of launching another uh, workshop or initiative where we can discuss together and try to put together the different experiences also in view of enriching this multi-layer assessment that we can promote at different levels which is probably a key action to understand what we can do what we can improve 
in the future and also for our projects. Thank you, Lorenzo. Madalena, would you like to comment on that kind of approach? Any thoughts? Yes, I think that uh, the multi-layered approach is uh, pivotal. We have a number of dimensions uh, and also we have to take into account time and maturity of the system. It probably, uh, along the journeys we have heard of uh, by our speakers, there have been times where they were capable of uh, detecting and measuring only a few indicators. So we do not have to expect that uh, any indicator set we will uh, deploy will be possibly uh, be detected and measured by everybody at all times. So the idea is to agree on the principles that are guiding the development of the indicators and allow people to pick and choose the indicators that are applicable and usable and sustainable for, any, for a specific uh, setting at a given time. So I think that uh, if we will uh, adopt a, a multi-step and a modular approach to bring together the indicators, uh, then we will uh, be able to provide uh, a, a support that is applicable and useful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think if there um, are there any final audience, any questions from our participants today? I'm not seeing anything in the chat. I know we've stopped recording this session. Um, so I may now start bringing this to a close. Um, I'd very much like to thank all of the speakers who gave their time today to us and delivered some really insightful and fantastic presentations. I understand these will all be available on the um, hub um, website so I think um, we'll be able to digest them and and take away much more detail but so um, from my perspective thank you all very much for joining and thank you again for the invitation to moderate this session it's been hugely interesting and I look forward to joining you in future webinars so thank you all thank very you much. Thank you everybody, bye bye. Thank you very thank much, you. bye. 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 Thank you.